official members bounce Bust off the chrome Realize it's real hell where we call home Official members bounce Bust off the chrome Realize it's real hell where we call home From the heart inside one I vision fat licks and mat clips The chrome will make the average imitator do backflips You lack a pistol So put a vest around the issue Sluts will never miss you Coming from members that's official Well, I discuss this, this will be a fun, really fun lecture. Uh, it's concurrent digital stuff, which I find super fascinating because it really breaks, can break your mind sometimes thinking about like how you normally write programs and what's going on, on the inside and what the application can see. Um, we'll, we'll talk a little bit about that today. Um, for everyone in the class, again, project one was due last night. Um, the, again, without naming names, but we were discussing this. Uh, someone got the highest score we've ever gotten on the leaderboard this semester. Uh, so congrats to that person. Um, like normally 25,000 QPS is what we normally see on the leaderboard, uh, but someone got 150,000, which you've never had before. And then we just saw this on the, the non-CMU one. The, the, the fastest we've ever seen for somebody who's not CMU was 95,000. So 150,000 is, is blowing everyone out of the water. Impressive. All right, so homework three is out, and that'll be due uh, this Sunday, actually October 6th, not September 6th. Uh, is that even the right date? Yeah. When, is it, when does that really do? It should be next week, right? Yeah, whatever this, is, whatever this is wrong, go by the website. Uh, project two is out today. I don't think we pushed the code yet, but the write-up is there, and you can start looking at that. And I'll discuss this at the end of this class, and uh, we'll, we'll announce the recitation for next week. And I'm going to say this multiple times throughout the, for the next three weeks. Project two is much, much harder than project one. So there was a bunch of people that waited the last minute to do project one, and yeah, you got it in, good. You're not going to be able to pull that same stunt off this time, okay? So you should be doing project two immediately. Right? As soon as the code comes out, start looking at it and start running it immediately. It will be much, much, much harder, much more difficult. Right? And you're not going to get by running printf statements to try to debug things anymore. You have to really use a debugger. The midterm exam will be, again, in class on, uh, on Wednesday, October 9th, again, in this room. And then we'll, I'll announce this and post the study guide uh, later this week. OK? I'll say also, too, quick about project one. The, there was a couple of people that used either ChatGPT or found some randos implementation on GitHub, and we changed the semantics of the buffer pool this year from previous years as they kept breaking a bunch of tests and not knowing why uh, they were failing. It's because, again, things have slightly changed from year to year. So I advise you, again, don't, don't do that. Uh, you're making your life harder. All right, and then for some database talks that are coming up, today, again, at, at 4.30, we have the, actually the creator of Data Fusion uh, is going to talk about something they've built at Apple called Data Fusion Comet. It'll be a Spark accelerator for, or accelerator for, for Spark. Basically, Spark is in Java. It's row-based. It's slow. Uh, we'll talk about next class what it means to be vector-based. And then so when you're running your Spark query, it can drop down into Data Fusion and run that really, really quickly. Databricks has their own thing called Photon. That's proprietary. It's not open source. This thing is open source. All right, and then also tomorrow, we're having a talk from one of the top people at Oracle talking about their, their JSON storage system. Uh, and that'll be in Gates 8115, and that one will be, there will be pizza, and that's open to the public. And then next week we have Parade DB, which is a, uh, it's a the version of Postgres where it drops down into Data Fusion uh, and other Rust, Rust uh, toolkits or libraries to accelerate the execution of queries. So it looks like Postgres from the outside, but the inside is doing a lot more. Okay, again, and these are all optional. All right, so last class we talked about different data structures. Right, skip lists, inverted indexes, vector indexes, uh, bloom filters or filtering. Um, and when we talk about the B plus trees, when we talk about the hash tables, we talk about these other data structures, we made this huge assumption that the, the, the data structure we were talking about would be single threaded. And we did this to simplify the, the discussion so we're not worried about tripping over different threads, updating things at the same time. But obviously, in, 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 a, in a modern system, we need to support multiple workers. You have threads or processes, we'll, we'll talk about later, but multiple workers running at the same time that want to make changes to our data structure, and we need to make sure that we don't break things. Right? And so that's what today's class is really about, is how we introduce safety mechanisms in our data structure so that we can take advantage of a modern CPU that has a lot of cores, or when one thread stalls because it has to get something from disk or over the network, right? that we can allow other threads to keep running at the same time and hide those stalls. That la the disk stall will be less of an issue for, for uh, maybe for the dashboards we're talking about, unless there's, there's, you, know, you have to get something from, from disk into memory. Um, but the other mechanism we talk about transactions later on that, that can hide these things as well. But it's really about these low-level primitives, how to make our, our, 
our data structure is thread safe. Now, I will say we're not going to talk about it, but there's a whole other category of database systems that don't do any of the things that we're going to talk about today. And because there's an argument to be made that introducing the latching protocols that we'll talk about just makes things slower, and that you actually would be faster if you just allow things to run single threaded, like only one, allow one thread to do one thing at a time, and then you don't have to do latching. Uh, and that'll make things actually run fast, fast as possible because you're basically running at bare metal speed. So the most famous one is probably Redis. Uh, you might have heard of that before. It does this, that's a single thread execution engine, single process, single thread. So only one query within the process can touch the data at a time. And therefore, you don't need any latches because there, there, it, there won't be any conflicts. Uh, there's VoltDB. It takes us to the extreme. Um, and that was based on a system I helped build called, called HDOR. There's another system called KDB out of this thing called KX. You've never heard of KDB. You probably never, never will see KDB unless you go to Wall Street. This thing is everywhere. And it doesn't use SQL. It has its own K programming language. But again, the, the, end, the core engine itself is single threaded. So it doesn't do a lot of these latching stuff. All right, so how are we going to make sure that our threads don't trip on each other uh, when, we're, when we're inside our data structure, inside the system? So this can be done through what is called a concurrent control protocol. And you can think of this as like the traffic cop inside the database system that is responsible for determining what thread or what worker is allowed to read what data at what time and in what way. Right? The idea is like if it's the thing we're going to use to protect a shared object or entity within our system to ensure correctness. And I'm putting the word correct in quotes here because there's two notions of correctness we, we could care about. There's logical correctness would be, can my worker or can my thread see the things that it should be allowed to see while it's running? Meaning like if I insert, insert you know, key five, if I do a read again, can I see, will I see key five? Or could it come back missing? Meaning someone like deleted it by the time I did my reads. All right, that's a higher level concept of correctness that we'll, we'll cover after the midterm. But you will see why we'll make certain decisions today where we know that something else is going to be responsible for maintaining this, this logical correctness. And there are, there's some optimizations we can do to, uh, to not slow things down. The thing that we're going to hear about today is the physical correctness, meaning how do we make sure that the internal representation of our data structure is, is going to be sound or correct? Meaning, if I do a lookup of, uh, you know, in, in, in a B plus tree and I, I get a pointer to the next page, that, page, that pointer is going to take me somewhere real. Right, either a memory address or a page that actually exists, which should be you know, part of the B plus tree, and not some random offset and not some random page with a bunch of garbage in it. Because by the time I read it, you know, I, 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 got the, I got the page I'm at, I read the pointer, then I, before I can follow that pointer, someone changes what the memory is pointing to underneath, and then now I land in, in no man's land and I seg fault. So that's the thing we care about today. How do we make sure that the, the data structure is correct when multiple threads are reading and writing to it at the same time? So begin, to begin, uh, we'll talk about what, what latches are and how you actually want to implement them. And this is going to be a high level overview to understand what's going on underneath the covers uh, with, with latching so that when we start using them in our system, we can understand the ramifications of protecting data structures with la latches in one way versus another. Then we'll see a really simple latching scheme for hash tables, uh, which would be pretty trivial to understand because hash tables are, are by themselves pretty simple. But then we'll spend most of our time talking about B plus tree latching because that's the end, what you need for project two, but also this is a more complicated scenario because you could have threads coming in different directions and splits and merges, and the data structure is more dynamic than, than a hash table. And then we'll finish off talking about how to do leaf node scans on, on the sibling pointers, and then we'll finish up talking about project two. Okay? And like I said, I'm gonna get very excited because to, to me this, is, this stuff is really cool, uh, but you know, tell me to slow down if, if I go too fast. All right, so we talked about this in the beginning of the semester. We talked about this notion between locks versus latches. And this is sort of like this, this conflict between what we in the database world think about the semantics or how to describe certain concepts in, in systems and what everyone else, the operating system world people, how they're going to describe things. And we're correct and they're wrong, uh, at least you know, within the database system. So there's a notion between a lock and a latch. And a lock is going to be used to protect transactions from each other. And latches are going to be used to protect workers, meaning processes or threads, like low-level things running in the system. So a lock is going to be held for the, the, the duration of a transaction. I haven't defined what a transaction is, but think of like running multiple queries at the same time, and I want them to be atomic. And they're going to be tent protecting the logical contents of, of the database, a table, a database itself, a, a single tuple. 
and then the database system is going to be have mechanisms inside that it's going to implement in its concurrency show protocol that it's going to allow it to detect when there's conflicts, when there's deadlocks or other problems, and can automatically roll back changes to make sure that we don't have partial writes or torn updates. Right? This is what sort of handling the unwashed masses, like the JavaScript program is sending us crappy queries or whatever, and we need to handle that in, in our system. The thing we care about today is, is the latching. Again, this is where we're, we, the, we have these primitives uh, that allow us to protect critical sections of our data structures, of our internals of our system, that are going to be uh, affected or, or, or touched by other working workers that we've implemented in our system running at the same time. So the critical sections for the, the latches we're going to protect are going to be really small relative to what locks are going to protect. Like think of lock as like I'm going to protect a tuple through multiple round trips between the application and, and the database server back and forth. Like th that could be typically milliseconds, but could be ordered in seconds. Worst case scenario, order hours, days. In the old days, you could have queries you know, run for hours and days. Uh, less, it's more rare now. But, but in, this, in this world, it's like in low level, like I'm going to jump into a page, do something, and then jump out right away. Right? Almost like the pin stuff you did for, for the buffer pool. And now, the thing about the latches is that there isn't going to be a high level traffic cop in our system that we're going to implement that's going to be responsible for deciding who gets to read what at what time and how to deal with deadlocks. It's only through us as the system programmers, it's our responsibility to make sure that we don't do something stupid. Easier said than done. We'll talk about how to handle some things later on, but like there isn't going to be something to bail us out in the way that we'll have for locks and transactions. Right? There won't be a deadlock detection algorithm running in the background. Another way to think about it is this nice table from uh, the guy, this guy, Gritz Graffy. Uh, again, the famous database researcher. He wrote that B plus tree book I mentioned last class. He's going to vent the volcano stuff we'll talk about next week. He's going to also invent a bunch of stuff with query optimizer stuff we'll talk about later on. But uh, in the B plus tree book, he's got this nice table where he shows the distinction between locks and latches. And the way to, to, to read this is that you sort of stop, start, from the tar start from the top and go down, and, and that sort of defines what this thing is actually doing. So in the case of latches, a latch is going to be, uh, it's going to separate workers from each other. That's going to protect the in-memory data structures uh, during, during the operations of the critical section. We'll talk about modes in a second, but it's only going to have two modes in a latch, read and write, right? Exclusive, non-exclusive. And then for deadlock, uh, handling deadlocks, it's through avoidance through, through coder discipline, making sure that we don't write bad code that could put us into a deadlock. And then we're going to maintain these latches inside our data structure. Again, there isn't going to be a separate lock table, there is, like in case of tr transaction locks. It's going to be in the, in the pages themselves of our data structure is where we keep track of what latches are set or not set. Locks, on the other hand, again, we'll cover this after the midterm. But again, these, these are for protecting transactions from each other. There's a lot more modes, shared exclusive update, intention locks. We'll cover these later on. Um, but again, and the, there'll, there'll be some, some higher level mechanism that can protect ourselves from deadlocks and, and handle things. You know, like deciding what, what thread to kill to break a deadlock. Whereas in our case, we, we, in latches, we won't have that. All right, so latches can only have, latches are going to have basically two modes, read mode and write mode. Uh, it's pretty much as you'd expect, right? So in read mode, you, you can have multiple threads read the same object at the same time. And if the latch being, that you want to acquire is already in read mode and you want to acquire it in read mode, then you, you can go ahead and acquire it as well. Right? You basically have a simple counter that says how many latches hold this thing in read mode. Write mode is a, you know, a synonym for exclusive mode, basically saying that there's some thread that can only have the latch in write mode at a time, and any other uh, latch acquisition requests are incompatible, and therefore it will have to wait. Right? So basically, read latch requests are compatible with read latches, uh, latches that are already held in read mode, and write latch requests are in incompatible with everything else. So now if you actually want to start implementing latches, uh, there's some things we're going to care about in the context of databases. Because again, these latches are, are going to be inlined in our data structure itself. We obviously want them to have a small memory footprint. And we don't want to store you know, a kilobyte of data just for the latch, because we could be instead storing that for the data itself. Because that's going to, be, again, have to sit in somewhere in memory. And then latches aren't going to, you know, even though we could store the latch itself in the page like within the frame of the buffer pool, we don't care about when it gets written out the disk because uh, you, know, you, wouldn't you wouldn't hold a latch for something that's going to get swapped out. 
because then the, the time of that latch becomes too long and it causes problems. We want to have a fast execution path when there's no contention in the latch, which would be the common case in most scenarios. Right? Most of the times you're going to go request a latch and it's going to be available, so you go ahead and acquire it. And you, so you want that to be that operation to be fast as possible. We can't. We want the management of the latches to be decentralized. Again, there isn't going to be a, a higher level table that's keeping track of what latches are being held by what workers. Everything has to be done in line. And then lastly, we want to avoid expensive system calls because anytime you have to talk to the OS or go down to the OS, that's just going to make things so much harder and so much slower for us. All right? And again, because we're database people, we don't want to rely on operating system primitives in a real system to do any of this. The operating system people say the opposite, right? So there's this famous post from Linus uh, from a few years ago talking about the pros and cons of spin locks, which we'll talk about in a second. And he's got, Linus has this big blurb, right? Do not use spin locks in user space unless you actually know what you're doing. And be aware that the likelihood that you know what you're doing is actually basically nil, right? So again, for that's for the unwashed masses. If you're actually someone responsible for actually building a database system, like we know what we're doing and he's actually wrong. So let's see how we can do better. So I'm going to talk about basically three uh, basic concepts that we can build on. Build up, uh, they're going to build one from on top one uh, on top of the other, uh, and we're going to end up building what, essentially what is a reader writer lock. Now, what I'll describe it has how to do it in the context of of an, an pthreads or standard you know, in the standard template library. But in a real system, you wouldn't rely again on pthreads or OS uh, OS level primitives. But for simplicity, I'm just going to show it in, in those terms. The more advanced implementations that we're not going to cover in this class, we cover in the advanced class, uh, are adaptive spin locks from Apple, uh, the QBase spin lock from MCS locks, and then there's this thing, optimistic lock coupling, that's used in uh, some of the German systems that basically has version information when you, when you acquire latches. I would say at this point, I haven't looked in a while like what is the best latching implementation you should use. I mean, Postgres has its own thing. Like A lot of the open source systems have, have their own implementations that are pretty primitive uh, compared to the more modern things you can do. Um, and then the, obviously the, the commercial systems are, are closed source, so you can't see what they are. I mean, the, and the, a lot of the commercial systems, they have to be also portable, right? So like the pthread implementation on like FreeBSD might be, is, is definitely different than what's on, on Linux. And so they'll, they don't want to rely on, on the OS providing these primitives and therefore they, they, they ship their own. So that way the, the semantics and the expected behavior will be mostly the same from one system to the next. But just to highlight again how, how, what extra things you can do. So this is the, a blog article from almost, almost 10 years ago, eight years ago from, from Apple talking about their locking mechanism called, called uh, Parking Lot, which again, I, as far as I know, this is the best one that's still open source today. Um, and so they had this little blurb in here talking about how if you rely on pthread mutex, their implementation is 64 times smaller uh, and 180 times faster than what the OS provides you. And again, that's like, that's like a hardcore, like tight loop benchmark, micro benchmark. Uh, but when they say we actually run it compared to other things, you know, in sort of more full, full work workloads, but about 10 to 5% faster. And just, just replacing the latch implementation, you can get a pretty significant improvement. All right, so let's look at the most basic latch you can implement, right? The test and set spin latch or spin lock, right? And so the way this basically works is that it's, you declare some flag or some, some variable as, as, what the, as the latch, so here I'm using syntactic sugar in C++ to say atomic flag uh, and define my latch. And this is just, again, a synonym for uh, defining an atomic Boolean. And so this is going to create a 8-bit you know, value that I can set, te call a test and set on. And so now if I want to acquire a latch, I just have something like this where I find the latch that I want to acquire, and then I have a while loop that says, keep trying to, to test and see whether it's false. And then if it's false, set it to true. And then if you're able to do that, return true. Uh, should be actually while test and latch. Yeah, if you, if, you can, if you can set it, actually this returns true, it should be a not here, right? So try to, try to get it. If you can't set it, just spin and keep trying over and over again. So that's why it's called a spin lock. You're just basically spinning over and over again until you can acquire the, the lock that you want, or the latch that you want. So this is obviously not scalable, because what are you doing here? If I can't get the latch, I'm just burning CPU cycles trying to set it over and over again. Um, so you can, inside this while loop, you can be a bit more clever. You can say, well, I've tried, you know, a million times. Let me stop and you break out, ret return back an error, which we'll talk about how to handle that in a second. Or I could yield my thread and say, well, I can't get this now. Let me sleep for a little bit, then, then try again. 
Um, but even if you do all those things, this is not going to be very friendly for modern CPUs, especially if you're running on a multi-socket system, because now, depending on where the latch is located, you might be going over an interconnect between the sockets trying to update things over and over again or, or check things over and over again. So we're not going to talk about like NUMA architectures in this class, but say you have a two-socket CPU and the latch is over here on this side. So this, if you have a thread over here running on this socket and it wants to acquire the latch, it's calling this you know, test and set over, over the interconnect to try to get this value. Uh, and that's going to be, it's much, much slower to go through that interconnect versus like running uh, in local memory. Does everybody know what NUMA is? Non-uniform memory access? Okay. So NUMA is this thing where, um, uh, I think on a multi-socket CPU, where every socket has its own local DRAM that you can access really, really fast. But there, there's other sockets, you can also access their DRAM, but now you're going over this interconnect, which I think is like 2x slower than your local DRAM. And so Intel does all these tricks to hide that, you know, the location of memory from you so that you don't have to worry about that, you know, where is it actually located. So it looks like giant uniform memory access, even though the speed from one address might be different than another address. You can get actually information about where the memory is located, so you can be clever about like, okay, well, I'm only going to access data that I know that's local on my DRAM. So all I'm trying to say is, is there's, there's some interconnect between these two. So for me to go access this DRAM, that's 2x slower than the guy trying to go get it locally. And so that sucks because now there's all this traffic on the interconnect. Again, think of like you know, two machines running in different data centers, right? It's not the same because we're talking about you know, you know, nanoseconds, but still it adds up. You're trying to spin this to get this thing over and over again. All right, does everyone know how this te test and set works or compare and swap in hardware? All right, so modern hardware, modern CPUs provide you these atomic instructions called test and set, compare and swap, right? They're, they're, they're basically the same thing, where you can give, uh, you, you have an instruction where you can give it a memory address and a value you expect to be in that address. And then with, within that single instruction, it then checks to see what that value is, what you, what you expect. And if it is, then it, you can go ahead and set it to your new value. And you can do this again atomically, meaning like you know that somebody else isn't going to come in between the time you check and then you set it and try to try to write to it before you can. All right. So this is a this is a built-in intrinsic. I think this is GCC. All right. Sync pool, compare and swap. So anytime you see like a double underscore in any kind of code uh, in C plus plus or C, it's, it's called an intrinsic. Think of like it's just an alias to the underlying instruction that the hardware provides to do exactly this. So even though instead of writing assembly, you would use use an intrinsic. All right, so in this case here, I have the address, the compare value, and the new value. So when this runs, it takes that memory address, looks to see what, you know, finds where it is, checks to see whether the value is, is, that's in there is what you expect it to be. And if it is, then again, within, within the, uh, a single atomic operation, you can go ahead and set it. So I think Intel added this in x86 in the 90s. ARM has their own version of this. Uh, you typically don't want to write intrinsics because it makes the code less portable. Like if you land on x86 versus ARM, uh, but you know, if, if you know your own hardware, then you should be okay. So the Atomics came out in C++11, and there's this great blog article from the guy that I think he, he runs the standards committee that talks about what the, the memory model and semantics of this are. But for our purposes today, we just we need to know, like, I, I want a single atomic operation to, to set, test some value, and if, I, if it's correct, then I go ahead and set it with what I want, meaning I know I've acquired the latch. All right, so that was the test and set. That's the most basic one. But in my example there, it was a single Boolean value, meaning there wasn't different uh, read-write modes for that latch, which is like, do I have the latch or not? So if you want to do something that's more complicated, uh, you can rely on start using OS primitives, like the OS blocking mutex. So this is what you get if you call a standard mutex, right? So you can say standard mutex M, and then it has the lock and unlock operation. All right? So everybody know what you get when you call standard mutex? What, what does the compiler actually give you? pthread mutex. What is a pthread mutex? How's that implemented? At least in Linux. What's that? Futex. futex, exactly. What is a futex? It doesn't actually do a lock if there's only like one thread or if there's no contention. Well, what, what does futex stand for? I don't know. Yeah. Fast, user, uh, fast user mutex. And so his point, yes, like he was describing it correctly. Uh, so the way it basically works is that it's our spin latch that we had in the last, last slide, or two slides ago, where that thing sits in user space. And the idea is that you don't have to go down to the OS to try to acquire a heavyweight mutex. You try to acquire the one in user space. Because remember I said, making system calls is very expensive. 
right? Because there's, there's the security permissions that has to do with the hardware, that you have to copy context. It, it, it sucks. We never want to do that. So if I now have two threads that try to acquire this latch, they both first acquire, try to acquire the user space latch. If one of them gets it, then they have the latch. The other guy has to go den now down to the OS and, and acquire lock, essentially a conditional variable or a mutex down there. Uh, and, and it waits until the other guy releases it. So I've, I've said before, you know, again, just now, why system calls are expensive. But now going down into the, the, to the schedule for the OS, that's even worse. Because how does, how does Linux maintain the list of, of, of what threads to schedule or processes to schedule? It's got its own hash table. How is it protecting that? It's got its own latches, right? So now you're taking latches down into this, this, this data structure to say, hey, I can't acquire this latch right now, but you know, wake me up or you know, schedule me when it becomes available. So now what should have been a single latch is multiple, multiple latches because I have to go tell the OS I can't be scheduled. So that's terrible, and we never want to do that. So the, and again, but this example here, it's still a single reader writer mode. If you want to support reader writer latches, there's more complicated examples, but the, at least in bus tub, we're using the SD, the standard template ladder shared mutex. Um, but the, you know, in any, any, other system, any other system would roll their own, again, relying on those, those spin latches as basic primitives. And then what they do after that, uh, whether they have a queue and keep track of things, that depends on the implementation. So if you call standard, standard shared mutex, what you get is a pthread rewrite lock, uh, which is actually a combination of some conditional variables and then another pthread mutex t, which again is just a few texts. So the basic idea is that in user space, we would have a counter that keeps track of how many, how many workers hold the latch in read-write mode uh, or di different modes, and then how many threads are waiting for, for this. And again, if you rely on the OS, the OS is going to keep track of this for you down, down in the, with the conditional variables down in the scheduler, uh, but we want to do this all, the, all this in user space. So now if a thread comes along and wants to acquire the latch in read mode, we check to see whether anybody holds it in write mode or read mode, and they don't, so we can go ahead and give it in read mode, and we increment our counter by one. Another thread comes along, wants to also get in read mode. Again, it's already in read mode, uh, so we can go ahead and give it the latch, increment the counter. Let's say now the thread, another thread comes along, wants to get it in write mode. It has to block and wait because the latch is being held in read mode. So we would, we would deschedule it, put it in some kind of queue where we can keep track of where it is. And then now, depending on, on our scheduling policy, if any other thread comes along and says, I also want this now latch in read mode, and so even though it's, I, can, I can potentially get it, because it is going to be held in read mode, because I have one writer waiting, it's going to block and, it's, and, and, uh, and have to sleep. Right? This, again, some additional metadata or queues are keeping track of who's waiting for what and how long you've been waiting and other things. And it depends on the sophistication. It depends on um, you know, what data structure you want to use this in. So if your critical section is really, really short, you probably maybe don't want to use something that's very heavyweight. Uh, Versus if the critical section might be a little bit longer, maybe a couple of microseconds or even a millisecond, uh, then, then this heavyweight stuff might actually make sense. But yes? Why do you want the third reader to be blocked? This question is why do you want the third reader to be blocked? For fairness, right? Because otherwise, if readers keep showing up, right, I'll never put it in, in write mode. So that's, so that's a really simple scheduling policy you could do for this. So as soon as someone shows up and, and that's, a, that's a writer, the writer gets higher priority. Okay. Again, so again, the different systems will do different things, but th these are the basic primitives we need to do the more complicated latching we need for in our or in our data structures. So let's start off with the easy case: hash tables. So we'll ignore the the, the extendable hashing and the linear hashing, uh, which we're, you could resize things, but the basic ideas are applicable to them that we'll talk about. So one of the advantages we're going to have in a hash table is that. Deadlocks are not going to be possible because all the threads are going to move in the exact same direction, meaning they're going to do some hash, and land in, in our data structure, assuming it's linear probing, it's just a, you know, a giant you know, array of, of slots. And then when they have to scan to find the matching key that they want, they're just scanning from the top down. And so as they go along, they can release latches behind it to free things up and acquire new ones going forward. But they know that nobody else is trying to acquire the latch uh, that they need if, you know, if they need a latch, if we need a latch, uh, and the person that holds the latch we need holds the latch, or is waiting for our latch, we know there can't be a deadlock because everyone's always going in the same direction. 
Now to size the table, this is more complicated. The most basic way to handle this is that you would have some, some page at the top, like the, the, the header of the, of the hash table, and you just put a global write latch in that thing. And anytime that you need to read it, you just set it in read mode, that's fine. Anytime you need to resize it, you set it in write mode, and then that locks the whole hash table, and you go ahead and, and double the size and, and rehash things, right? But we can ignore that. So the big question now, which you want to do hash table latching, is which, what, what granularity we want to have, the granularity of the latches we don't want to have in our data structure, because that's going to determine how much parallelism we'll be able to achieve. But again, it would be a classic computer science trade-off between compute versus storage. We could have a single latch for the entire data structure. The amount of space it takes to store that single latch is small, but then that makes our, latch, our, our hash table basically single-threaded. Or we could have latches for every single individual slot that will increase the amount of parallelism we have, but again, now we have to store that latch uh, in our data structure, in, our, in every single block or page. So that's the basic two choices we have. Right? So you can have either latches at the page of the block or the latches within each individual slot. So let's see what that looks like. So say we do either the page or block latches. So a thread T1 comes along. They want to find D. So the first thing we do is hash D. And say we land into this block here. So I'll just take a, uh, a read latch on the entire block. And so that, that implicitly locks uh, these slots with here within, within my page or in my, in my block. Then I can use the, you know, the linear probe scanning and go try to find the, the, the record we want. right? Uh, and then. In the meantime, another thread shows up, and they want to insert E. So when it, ha it hashes it, it wants to insert it into this record here, right? But now we want to take this latch, and we want to take this block in, in write mode, but that's incompatible with the latch that's being held in read mode. So this thread has to stall because we don't know what you know. We don't know what, what this thread's actually trying to do, other than, than it's just trying to read things. All right, we don't know there, there could have been a free slot where it could have inserted something and not interfere with the, 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 the other thread that's reading inside of it. All right, so then now T1 keeps scanning through the page, and then when it's done, it jumps down here. Uh, it can go ahead and release the, the latch on the first page, even before it jumps to the second page down here, because it's not dynamic. We know that these things have to be read in, in order, right, from top to the bottom. So we can go ahead and release this latch even before we acquire the latch on this one here. Because we know that someone isn't going to try to insert a new page inside, inside, inside here while we're, in, we're going into it. So we're not going to be, do, be able to do this when we talk about B plus trees. We have to hold on the latch where we're currently at before we jump to the next page or the next node and acquire that latch because we don't know whether someone's going to start reorganizing things and swap out where, where we actually should be going to. So this is one of the key differences between hash tables and B plus trees. All right, so then now, again, it gets the read latch. You can do a read here. The T2 can, can then acquire the, the right latch on this page. Go ahead and do its insert, uh, but can't find a free slot. It has to go down here. Again, wants to get this thing in, in write mode, but it can't because this guy's here. Wait till that guy releases it. Then it gets the right latch, and then go ahead and keep scanning and, and do the insert. All right? Slot latches are basically the same thing, but again, more fine grain. So I come here now, and I don't acquire the latch on the page. I acquire the latch on the value or the, or the slot. I'm try, trying to find the thing I'm looking for. This guy jumps down here ahead of me, gets the right latch. Uh, so now when this guy scans down and tries to do, do the read latch on the, next, on the next slot, it has to block and wait. It actually could, re could, could release the latch up above. I didn't show that. Um, yeah, there it is. So then, then this guy keeps scanning, going down. This guy has to, again, keep blocking. Uh, until this guy does his insert, and then the, the guy down below can get the, uh, find his read. Right? Pretty straightforward. And so in extendable hashing or linear probe hashing, or sorry, li linear hashing, you basically want to do page level latches, uh, and then you have a sort of separate latch for controlling the split pointer and that, that the sort of extra metadata you would have in front of the hash table. All right, let's talk about B plus trees because that, that's more complicated and more fun. So again, we want to allow multiple threads to, to, to access our data structure at the same time. And we want to avoid two specific situations. And they're obviously going to be related to splits and merges because that's when the, the data structure itself is reorganizing. And therefore, the pointers may end up being invalid if we come in at a bad time. Right? So let's look at an example here. So say we now we have T1 wants to delete 44 down here at the bottom. 
So it's, it's scanning down, to, follows the, 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 the guidepost to figure out when they want to go left and right. We get down here, we find 44, we go ahead and, 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 and delete it, right? But now in this case, this note I, the leaf note I is, is less than half full, so we're gonna have to rebalance. We're gonna have to move a, you know, steal from a, a sibling. So we're gonna move 41 over. Well, let's say now before we can do, uh, uh, do that move over, we get descheduled. For whatever reason, the OSSI is descheduled this thread or the, whatever the, the, the system scheduler, whatever, our, our thread is paused. But then now T2 shows up and they wanna find 41. So the same thing, they started the root, they start scanning down the bottom, tells them to go down this way. And then now at this point, they're at node D, they look at, they look at the, the internode's keys and they say, oh, I wanna, I wanna follow, to find 41 between 38 and 44, so I wanna go down to, to node H. But then it gets descheduled, T1 wakes up, it goes ahead and moves 41 over, and it's done, that's fine. But then now T2 wakes up, it follows that pointer, which was valid on the last, uh, you know, on the last slide, or the, so when it last looked at the uh, node D, it gets down to H and it gets a false negative. Right? It completely missed the, the, the key that should have been there because someone moved it while it was running. So this is, you know, obviously dangling pointers is bad, but this is another example we would have, you know, correctness issues, uh, physical correctness issues with our data structure. Right, because again, there's no global status about telling other threads what we're doing down inside our data structure. We can only observe what the nodes that, that we're connected to are looking at. So we're going to, way we're going to handle this is through a concurrent protocol called latch crabbing or latch coupling. I think the textbook calls it latch coupling. On Wikipedia calls it latch coupling. The basic idea here is that we want a way to allow, uh, uh, we specify how we want our threads to acquire latches as they're going down in such a way that we can ensure that something is going to get moved down below us and invalidate the, the, the information we've gathered on our way down into the data structure. And the way this is going to work is that we'll get a latch for, for the, the, you know, whatever parent we're looking at, hold that, figure out where we need to go next, then get the latch for the child node, the one below us, so where we need to go. And then when we get to that child node, if we know that it's considered safe, meaning we know that it won't split or merge based on the operation that we're doing, then we can go ahead and release, release the latch on our parent. And it's sort of called latch crabbing because it's like, it's like supposed to walk like a crab as you go down. Monkey bars might be another good example where like, I, you know, before I can jump to the next monkey bar, I have to hold, hold on to the one I'm currently holding swing over and then I can let go of the one behind me, All right? So for find, uh, we're basically taking read latches all the way down, just, uh, just you know, until before, and then because we're doing a read operation, it's always safe for us to unlatch the parent. It's for the inserts and deletes, that's where we have to check whether once we latch our child we're jumping into, if it's safe, then we can go ahead and release all the, the latches on our ancestors, you know, on, on our parent above. Because we may in some cases have to hold the, the latch for the, for the root until we reach down far enough, we know things are safe. All right, so let's say T1 wants to find 38. Again, start off the root. I get the, the root in, in read latch mode, jump down to B, get that in read latch mode. At this point here, I'm on B. I, there's, nothing, there's no information about A that I need to get down, you know, further down because it told me where to go next. So it's safe for me to go ahead and release the latch on A, right? Because I'm obviously doing a read operation. Get down to D, same thing, release the latch on B, get down to H down here, release the latch on D, and then I do my read and I'm done. All right? That's pretty easy. Let's say now we want to delete 38. So again, we, we get the right latch on A, get down to B, get the right latch on that. Now again, we're doing a delete. So at this point, as we hold the right latch on B, we don't know what's going to happen below us in our data structure. We don't know whether the, the, the leaf node is going to have to do uh, a merge, and therefore that could cause uh, sort of reverberate a, a chain reaction up the tree that would cause us have to do uh, to, to merge B with something else. So because of this, we can't release the latch on A because we don't know whether we would update A because we did a merge. But then when we get down to D, at this point here, we recognize, okay, well, I mean, my simple example here, I, I have two cute keys. Uh, but at this point, I know that no matter what, if I delete below me in D, I know that I'm not, if I have to do a, a merge down below, 
I can easily delete, I can accommodate a deleting one key in D. So therefore, I'm never going to have to do any modifications to B and A above me. So at this point here, we know that B is not going to merge, so therefore we can release the latches on, on uh, B and A. In what order should I release the latches on B and A, or A and B in this example? What's, what's that? You said first B, then A. Why? So the opposite of the order you acquired them. Yes. Uh, deadlock. So if you release A before B, then someone wants to acquire A, then acquire B. You have B. They have A. You're deadlocked. So she said uh, you have to do, release B before A because you're worried about deadlocks. Yeah. So in, deadlocks can't happen in this example here because everyone's going to be going, starting from A, right? So you get the, you have to get the latch on A before you can get the latch on B. So there isn't a situation where someone would hold B and not A in this example here. So from a correctness standpoint, both are correct. Like you can go top down from bottom up, or top down or bottom up. But for performance reasons, you actually want to go top down. Because again, the way to think about this is the latch on A implicitly has right latch on everything down below. Right? So no one, even if someone wants to come around on this side and do a read, they can't do that because I hold the latch on A. So I'm going to release the sort of the most encompassing latch first. In that case, it would be the root. And that could allow other threads to go down on this side here and not get blocked on me holding that latch. So you always want to leash the latches on the top going down. Because that, that maximizes or increases the, the amount of parallelism. But both are still correct. Yes? So he says, the reason why we, the question is, why, why do we know that, that D will not merge with C? So at this point here, I have two keys, right? So I get down here. So no matter what happens below me, right, if I have to delete one of these guys down here and delete one of my guidepost keys, I can absorb that, that update and not have to go update my parent. Right? Yes. This question, would this be considered a, a deadlock by, by like the LLVM's threat standard or Google's threat standard? Uh, I don't think so. Why would it? We can take that offline, but it shouldn't. Um. I'll have to double check whether we. I'll double check. The thing is online. I'll double check whether in project two we, we tweaked the thread sanitizer or give it permit, like, to try to avoid, like, false, false positives. But it shouldn't be an issue. Again, the, o, see, the OS told you what? You released them in the order that you acquired them? No, the reverse order you acquired them, because otherwise it would be a test. So who told you this? The thread sanitizer or just OS classes? I think But they're wrong, right? I'm, like, it should be pretty obvious, right? You want to release A because that, that unlocks implicitly all the other side of the tree. Yeah, they're wrong. I don't know who told you that. It's wrong. <laughs> okay. All right, so again, we get down here. Then we get down to this guy uh, on H. And again, I know I have to delete one of the key 41. I can, I can this, this node H can absorb that right. I go ahead and release the latch on D. Go ahead and do my delete, and, and then I'm done. Or, I'm sorry, delete key 30, 38. Inserts can work the same way. So I want to insert 38, uh, sorry, insert 45. That's down here, right? So I, I scan, scan down, take the right latch on, on A, take the right latch on B. And again, at this point here, I know that if I have to do a split and another key is going to percolate up from the bottom of the tree into B, I have space to accommodate it. So I can go ahead and release the, the latch on A, right? Because I'm never going to have to modify it. Now I get down to D, and it's the opposite. I don't know what's below me in, in my, my leak nodes. So if a new key does come up, I'm going to have to split D here. So therefore, I can't release the latch on B. But only when I get to the bottom, now I see, OK, well, I'm not going to have to split this node. So it's OK for me to release uh, B and D. And I get release B followed by D. Do my insert, then I'm done. All right, so let's see now if you insert key 25. 
So I get the same thing. I get the right on A. Uh, I get the right on right latch on B. Get down here. I can re release the right latch on A just like before because I know that I'm never going to have to update it. I get down to C. Same thing here. I know I, have, I would have room for it. So therefore, I, I can release the latch on B. But now when I get down to F, I see, okay, well, I am going to have to do a split. Right? So in this case here, I take the right latch. I maintain the right latch on C. I insert uh, 25. But then I got to create a new node. Uh, these things just get slid over on visualizations. These pointers haven't changed on, on, on D and its leaf nodes. Then I add the, the new leaf node uh, for J and put the new guidepost key into to C and, uh, and point to there. Do I have to take the latch on, on, on leaf node J that I just added? To update this, yeah, sure, yeah. Um, or sibling on F? Or if, if you're going yeah, if, if you're going reverse direction, if you have to update G, potentially yes. Uh, we, we can ignore that. Um, but basically no, because again, I have right latch on this node here. Nobody can read this thing until I release my right latch. So implicitly, I also have J in, in, with a right latch. So therefore, it's safe for me just to do, do my update there. And then once I have it, once it's all done, then I'll go ahead and, and release the latches. This question is, is this the same reason why we don't want to merge nulls from the same level? What do you mean? Uh, your question is, why don't we want to do what? Sorry? Like, why don't we? So we're going back here, I can't, I can't steal from these guys, right? These are full. Yeah. All right. Oh, sorry, I'm doing insert. So there's no place for me to put anything. I, I got I to make a new node, right? So it goes there. I'm missing a sibling pointer, but it would go there too. We'll talk, about how to we we'll talk about how to take the latch going this way in a few more slides. But you, you would take the latch on this. Because again, you're not updating its parent. You're just updating what this, the sibling pointer is. So I, I get a right latch on this guy, update the sibling pointer, point it back to my new one. We'll talk about a few more slides. OK. So in all my examples, what's the very first thing I did anytime I want to update the, the data structure? I believe it would be B plus 3. So la take a right latch on the root. All right. And this basically is going to limit the amount of parallelism we can achieve because it's basically it's putting our data structure in like a single threaded mode. Because right? again, the, nobody else can take a, even a read latch on the root if I'm holding it in right latch mode. So a better approach is to basically do this optimistic lock coupling. Um, it's, I think the, the algorithm is called the bear schlotnik algorithm because it's written by this guy, Bear Schlotnik. Bear was the guy that, that invented the B-plus tree at Boeing with the other guy from CMU uh, back in the 70s. I think this paper is from like 77 or 79. And, and they're going to make this observation that, well, most of the times, the, 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 the root node is going to be safe from any splits or merges, right? Assume you have these the really high fan out. I'm showing my examples with two, two keys per node. Think of like hundreds of keys per node. So the likelihood within any insert or delete operation that I'm going to have to you know, update the root is very, very low. So I'm going to assume that splits and merges are rare. And therefore, I'm going to take read latches all the way down to the, to the data structure until I get to my leaf node. Then I take it in write mode. Because most of the times, that's going to be good enough. And if I'm wrong, then I just repeat it again and take, you know, take the pessimistic right lockdown, right latches all the way down. So we're going to see this technique later on when, when transactions, because there's a whole protocol called automatic concurrent control that was embedded here at CMU, where basically, again, I'm going to assume that conflicts are going to be rare. And therefore, I take the fast path of, of you know, taking latches or locks in a more permissive mode, and then just double check at the end, was that was that assumption correct or not? And, and fix myself if, if need be. Intel used to have this actually in the harbor in x86 in the 2010s. Uh, this thing called TSX, transactional memory. And it did basically the same thing. You could declare a block of C++ code or C code as being transactional. And it would run it. Then when, 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 you, when you finish that transactional piece of code, it would then check to see whether any invariants were violated. And then if, if not, you would just run just fine. Uh, it, you know, just kept kept running. If if you did violate, it, then it would roll back and run it in a more uh, in a sort of single threaded mode. That was invented by a professor that used to be here at CMU, Maurice Hurley. Uh, he also invented linearizability, which we'll cover later on. Um, 
I think then Intel found a bug in it and they turned it off. And I've, I, don't, I don't think it's still, still turned off as far as I know. Um, but this is actually, this basic idea was using, using hardware, which is pretty cool. All right, so with this better latching algorithm, what we're gonna do is if it's a read operation, a find operation, the same as before, just take read latches all the way down and then releasing the parent once we know, once we land on our child node. If it's an insert or delete, we're gonna set the latches uh, in read mode as if we were doing a, a read or find operation. Then when we get to right above the leaf node, we take the, the leaf node in write mode, uh, and then we check to see whether we're gonna have to split and merge. If we don't, then we're fine. We just do our update and we're done. If we do have to do a split and merge, then we just abort our operation, come back and, and try again. So I'm going back here, deleting 38 down here to the bottom, right? I take, uh, the thread goes down, takes read latch. As soon as it lands on the child on B, it releases the latch on A. Gets down to D, takes that in read mode, that's fine. Releases the latch on B, gets down to H. Release the latch on D. And at this point here, we know that our guess turned out to be correct because we're deleting a key. We're still going to be more than half full. So therefore, we're not going to do, have to do a merge. So therefore, we can do our delete uh, and not worry about rebalancing anything. Right? So this is a huge win for us because now we're not pessimistic blocking things from coming down to the tree if they're reading other parts of the branches as they're going down because we only took the right mode latch for just one node at the bottom. Same thing if we're doing insert, right? Take relatch here, that's fine. Relatch here, that's fine. You know, release, release latch on A, get down to C, right? Get down to F. Now we recognize, okay, we are gonna have to do a split. So therefore, we'll just restart our execution and take right latches on the way down. And obviously, you could be a bit clever and say, okay, well, you know, maybe I'll keep track of like, what was the last, you could say, what was the last node where I, I could have been unsafe? and therefore take read latches up to that, right? You could do that, but that's maintaining additional metadata, uh, which could just be slower and then just blindly restarting and starting, starting over again. Okay? So most systems are gonna implement some, some variant of, of this algorithm here. Again, and, and we'll see this idea of like optimistically doing something, uh, you know, the fast path and then rolling back if you get it wrong. We'll see this in other parts of the system as well. All right, so the, all the threads and examples we've shown down before, so far in our B plus tree have been going in, again, this top-down manner, right? In this case, there, wasn't any, there couldn't be any deadlocks because everyone's starting from the top and going down and only inquiring latches in that order. But as we said last class, we're going to have uh, these sibling pointers that can now allow threads to, at least along the leaf nodes, go left and right. In the case of the B link tree, they have, they have uh, sibling pointers within the inner nodes, but we, we can ignore that for now. Um, I can show how to handle that later on if, if you're curious. But now we could have deadlocks because now leave, we, have, we have threads coming in different directions and need to acquire latches that the other guy holds. So really simple example here. We have T1 wants to find all the keys greater than four. So you start at, start at A, get the, get the read latch on this node, get down to C, and now we're doing an ascending scan. So now we need to go in, in this order and we're not gonna release the latch on C until we get the latch on B because we need to know that the, the pointer we're pointing to is still correct. Like this is the right node we, we should be looking at. If someone doesn't swap it out uh, uh, from us while we're trying to get over. So then, that, then we get over to, to B, we can go ahead and release the latch, latch on C. That's straightforward. If we have another thread running at the same time and wants to scan in different directions, so T1 wants to get all the keys greater than one, T2 wants to get all the keys less than four, so they can both get the, the root node in, in, in a read latch mode, then they get the, the, their two leaf nodes, B and C, in relatch modes accordingly. And then now, that as they want to scan across, because these latches are compatible with each other, it's, they're allowed to acquire the, the, the opposite nodes in the, right, the relatch mode, and then they just swap over. That's fine. That's easy. So now if we acquire, have one of them do an update, T1 wants to delete four, and T2 wants to find out the key is greater than, greater than, than one. So let's say that this guy gets in there first, he gets the read latch, uh, so he, he gets down below. And say again, we're doing that optimistic lock coupling where he gets the T1, got the, the A in read mode, gets down to C, and wants to do a delete, recognizes that it can absorb the write, or it can absorb the delete without merging, so it just gets C in, in write latch mode. But now B wants to again scan across and start looking at all the keys in, 
in node, sorry, T1 wants to scan across and get, look at all the keys in, in, in leaf node C, but it can't acquire the latch because the other thread is holding the, that leaf node in, in write mode, all right? So the question is, what, what should it do? There's three choices. One is it could wait. Two is it could kill itself. Abort the operation, and you're shaking your head no. Abort its operation and come back and retry, right? Hoping that the next time you come around, the, the latch will be available. And the alternative is you try to kill the other guy. Take their latch, take their wallet, right? And, and do whatever you want to do. Which one's the right choice? I gotta wait. I raise your hand if you say wait. Raise your hand if you say kill yourself. Or sorry, yeah, kill yourself. <laughs> and raise your hand if you say kill the other thread. Why? How would you kill the other thread? Um, Why would you want to do it? And how how would you do it? Then the other thread would have to start over again. Yeah, but how would you do it? The latch, you mean? Yeah, latch. But like, what does that mean, access to the latch? I guess you can't. Yeah. So like, if his, his suggestion was, oh, what if I just reset the latch and then so that, that way I can take it? Okay, that's fine, but how do you tell the other thread that they don't have the latch anymore? Right, you could have like a, a, a little global flag that says, okay, you know, kill yourself, <laughs> but you don't, you don't know when they're gonna check that. Sig kill. Sig, well, that's, that, that takes down everything. Yeah, but he's close. You could you could send a signal, right? But but how do you how do you handle that? You need an interrupt handler. You're gonna put that sprinkle that in your code, and that's gonna suck, right? So this is not even really an option for us because we can't we can't do it. If we and if we could do it, like ch you know check some flag to see whether I should kill myself. Now when you do that, do you check every single time you before you run a line of code? Go check to see whether you should kill yourself. That would be impossibly slow, right? And we said wait. A lot of you, a lot of you have voted for wait. How long? He says pretty fine time. Pretty fine time out. What does that mean? One hundred milliseconds. He said okay. Wait. He says wait for. Let's take it. How about a millisecond? Okay. okay. He said, if you still can't get the latch, then you just retry. I said, kill yourself and retry. Yeah. Is one millisecond good enough? Yes. Uh, in the C node, we only had four, and, and it got deleted. So deleting four would delete the node. Uh, All right, so his question is, uh, statement is, well, what if this case here, three wasn't here, and I delete four, and I, now I have to do a, 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 a merge? Right? Um, I mean, again, this is a toy example, but uh, you would have had to acquire the. the right I don't know, but you could have done that because this guy would have got the read latch on this, give up the read latch of above, this guy gets the right latch on that, holds the right latch, comes down here. So, yeah, you could still do that. Why don't you just wait? Again, that's what we're saying. She said, just wait. For how long? He said 100 milliseconds. I got him down to a millisecond. So he says, wait until the other latch is released. Okay, when, when will that happen? Does it matter? Does it matter? Uh, well, what if, what if they're, again, assuming I have a billion keys, and this, I'm on leaf nodes, and it goes all the way over there, right? There's a bunch of, there's more leaf nodes over here. Does this guy, does this thread know what this thread is doing? No. no. So how long, how long, you know, doesn't know how long it's going to take? Yes. Her question, her statement is, how is killing yourself better than waiting or this different from waiting? Because if I, if I kill myself, I'm going to come back and basically start waiting all over again. So the, so, I mean, so, I'll answer your question or statement. Like, the correct answer is going to be kill ourselves, uh, but you could do a little bit of waiting. And the, the little bit of waiting could depend on what you've done so far. 
Meaning like if I had to do a bunch of updates, this, I mean, this guy's read only, so it's not that big of a deal. And the index is just stupidly small. But like, if I did a bunch of updates, I got to hold the right latches for all, all the pages I, or notes I modified. So other threads may be blocked waiting for me to re release those latches. And as soon as I can free them up, they can maybe do a bunch of reads. But if I did, say, a, a million updates, then it was really expensive for me to do all those updates. So killing myself might actually kind of suck too because I would basically throw away a bunch of useful work. So you should sleep, but like not a millisecond, maybe like sleep, like a yield to the scheduler and then come back and kill yourself. And it seems kind of counterintuitive because like, like it seems wasteful, right? But again, we don't know, the other thread doesn't know anything about what the other threads are doing. And oftentimes the most simple thing for this situation here, because we're really worried about like, you know, microsecond times in our data structure, accessing these nodes, killing yourself is actually going to be the best thing to do. So to answer your question is like, I don't know how much work the other guy did, so therefore, and I don't know how much work it, it, it still needs to do, so therefore I don't know how long I should be waiting for. And depending on how much work I've done, I could then be a little more sophisticated and say, okay, I've done a lot, so therefore maybe just wait a little bit longer, not milliseconds, like again, maybe like one, one round of scheduling, but not, not indefinitely, because I may be blocking other people, blocking other threads trying to access the data structure. Now, when we talk about locks and transaction locks, that's a whole different ball game because we know exactly what everyone is doing because SQL is declarative. And we know what work you've done already. And in some cases, depending on how the transactions are submitted, I know what work you're going to be doing in the future. So therefore, I can make a better decision to decide what, what thread to kill to, to break a de this deadlock or break, break up this, this impasse. But that's where, again, that's when it's like the, the millisecond scale down to nanoseconds or microseconds, we don't have the time to, to, and don't want to maintain data structure to keep track of this information. That's why just, again, shooting yourself in the head, um, rolling back anything you've done is, is going to be oftentimes the best thing to do. So then you say, okay, what about the case where it's a high contention data structure where I keep restarting over and over again and I keep having to kill myself because I can't get the latches I need. Well, when you, when you, when you roll back, and, and, and abort and try, try again, there is a higher level mechanism, like a schedule of, of the system would keep track of like, okay, you've gone to this data structure a million times, you can't do what you need to do. Let me stop, let me stop scheduling other threads from running so that your query can run and do what it needs to do because you've been waiting so long and now you have a higher priority. But that mechanism is not inside of our data structure. Because think about it, you would have to recreate that for every single B plus tree you have in your system? No. Right? That would be wasteful because now they're all maintaining their own, their, their own, their own you know, history information. All that should be in the higher level parts of the system. And so again, that means that in, 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 the, in the, the code of the system that actually uses these indexes, it, there's going to be a little while loop in there that says, try to insert this key. And there's some failures are not recoverable. Like if I try to insert a unique key and it comes back and it already exists, yeah, I don't want to retry. That, is, that, is, it, that won't make sense because that's, that's a... It's a high level integrity violation. So that goes back and report the error. But if I, if I can't do the insert because I can't acquire the latches I need, then I want to be able to retry. And maybe I back off on, on, that, on that loop, or sleep a little bit longer before I retry again. So simplicity is going to be our, 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 uh, our benefit, or to our benefit here. All right? So this is basically what it, repeating what I just said. So the latches aren't going to support any dialect detection avoidance. Or me mechanisms. So there's nothing to say, okay, you have this latch, I have this latch, let's try to figure out how to get along and how, how to share things, right? It's, I only have in the scope of my thread running in my data structure what I know about myself, and therefore I should be able to just go ahead and kill myself. Because again, I can't send a signal to the other person, right? I can't set a flag to tell them to, to kill themselves. I have to just, I, I can only deal with myself, right? And this is sometimes called the no wait mode. I would say al like almost no wait, because again, it's okay to put a little bit of sleep in. But, but microseconds, not 100 milliseconds is, is like basically going halfway to the country and back, right? Across the country. Or going around the world is 300 milliseconds, I think. So like 100 milliseconds is, is super, super long. Don't do that. And again, there's this, this, this query engine thing, thing we'll talk, talk about next class. This is the, this is the part that's going to be responsible for figuring out, okay, I, I couldn't do my operation because on this data structure because I couldn't quite the latches I need. Go ahead and retry. And this is, all in, this is all transparent to the query that you're actually trying to run, 
Like when you get your query response, you don't care that I tried to acquire a latch in this B plus tree 20 times and I couldn't do it, right? The query, it'll, it'll run a little bit slower, but you don't tell the application anything about this because they don't need to know. They don't care. Now, in obvious scenarios where if everyone's trying to update the exact same key, then there's no magic scheduling we can do to make that work well. Right? If everybody's trying to update, for whatever reason, the same, same page a billion times in a second, that's going to become bottleneck no matter what. Right? And there's, there's, it, within the data structure itself, there isn't ways to handle that. There's ways to handle that in, uh, in, in, in transactions at a higher level, higher level parts of the system. Like, was it last year people crashed the, the, the Taylor Swift ticket system crash or whatever? Because they were doing transactions the wrong way, most likely. There's, there's, there's the high level things to be able to handle that, which we can talk about. All right, so this is clear. So again, this is a low, this, it's a low level data, data structure concept where I can't get the latches I need, I go ahead and kill myself, but I'm going to retry again. And someone else is going to be responsible for telling me to retry. And I could have some additional history to make better decisions the next time I retry, maybe sleep a little bit longer uh, the next time I try again. But beyond that, there's no introspection into what other threads are doing because you, you simply can't know. Because by the time they get in and out and you make any decisions based on that, uh, you know, they're already out of, this, out of the data structure. And I can have hundreds of these B plus trees running at the same time in my, in my database. Okay? Yes? Yeah, so his question is, if a thread kills itself, how does it know to keep track? How does it keep track of what it knows it needs to undo? So basically, you, you, you have in thread local storage, you keep track of, like, I updated this node. This, this, is the, this is the change. This is what I took out or, or put in there, like, so you can just reverse it. And then when you, when you roll back, you undo that yourself. And you, get, you want it to be atomic, so you don't have to do, do partial, update, partial rollbacks. Okay? All right, so uh, this is very, very hard. Um, and we, you know, we barely scratched the surface on how to make B, B plus trees thread safe. You know, there's enough here for you to be able to do project two. But like I said, there's a whole bunch of other optimizations that, that you could potentially do, like delaying updates so that uh, you don't have to do splits and merges right away. We saw similar things with like, the B epsilon tree with the, the mod locks in every single node to make these updates go faster. But at the end of the day, at some point, you're gonna have to reorganize things and therefore you do need latching to protect yourself. I would say also too, a lot of the techniques we talked about in the B plus trees are gonna be applicable to other data structures. Skip lists are, are, are different beasts, but like the art in, the, the tries, um, some of the inverted index stuff, again, the latching stuff that we talked about here today, are, are, you can apply to those guys as well, okay? All right, so next class, we're finally gonna talk about how to do all the stuff we've done, you know, take all the pieces we, we've talked about so far this semester, and now run, run real queries. Uh, so we'll quickly talk about, again, what the execution engine is going to look at at a high level, but then I think we'll start off talking about the sorting algorithms uh, and aggregations. And then there we'll get into to joins and then full-fledged query execution. And that'll take us up to the, the midterm. Okay? All right, project two. So for project two, you're going to be building a, a, a thread-safe uh, B, uh, B plus tree. And then the, the pages in your B plus tree are going to be backed by pages in your buffable manager, right? So if your buffable manager has bugs, then you're going to have a really hard time when you build the B plus tree because now you're not going to know whether you're seg faulting because your data structure is wrong or your buffable manager is you know, on the fritz. So I'll talk about it in the next slides, but there's basically four steps. You define what the pages should look like, then the basic insert, delete, and operations for them. Then you have to build a C++ iterator so that you can scan along the leaf nodes, and then you have to, again, put it all together and make it thread safe. So we'll define what all the API you'll need for, for the different parts of the data structure, and you're just going to fill, fill in the methods. And again, this is much, much harder than project one. Do not wait till the last minute. You should start immediately. OK? All right, so the first task, you're going to define what the page layout is. And this year, the page layout is going to be different than previous years. We've done the B plus tree. So if you use ChatGPT, it's going to break. Um, and so. For simplicity, you're only going to need to support unique keys. You don't need to support non-unique keys. So you don't have to worry about overflow pages that, that we talked about. Uh, it's, it's just going to be for, for unique keys. The basic operations to start with are point queries, uh, uh, do single key lookups. So no, you know, not worry about necessarily range scans within the, the, the data structure itself. 
and then inserts with no splitting and removal with, uh, with sibling stealing and then splitting merging. So in the first, the, first, uh, the first phase here, the first two tasks, or three tasks, this doesn't need to be thread safe. So you can get that working, the basic data structure working, and not worry about other threads coming in at the same time. And we have separate tests that, that can check these things. Then the third task would be uh, to, again, an index uh, iterator. So there's a C++ the, the standard type of library specifies what an iterator API should look like. So you have to implement one of those. So you can put it in a regular for loop uh, in your test code. And I'm pretty sure this is true, but I'll double check. You only need to support extending scans because uh, I think the iterator only, can only go uh, plus plus go up and not go, not go re reverse direction. And then you can finish off by talking about how to do or ha how to implement or extend your data structure to support uh, a concurrent index with latch grabbing and coupling, the basic of what we talked about here. But then there's, there's other uh, optimizations that we can talk about if, if you're curious. So the, the, the semantics of what the data structure should do in different situations, you should follow what we talk about in, in the textbook, uh, which I, again, I think the slide follows as well. But if there's any like discrepancy between the slides say one thing and the textbook says something different, go by with what, what's in the, the textbook. This shouldn't be an issue, I think, for this year because we cleaned up the tests. Uh, than previous years. But if, if, again, if you're unsure, follow, just follow the textbook and not like other like, online guides what, or Wikipedia. The other advice I give also too is make your page size and your buffer manager small, like 512 bytes, and this will cause it to do splits and merges more, more, more quickly than if you have larger, larger, uh, uh, larger page sizes. And then this happens every year. Make sure you always protect what the root page, uh, uh, root page ID and data member looks like. Because that can, again, if you do a split on the merge, sorry, if you do a split on the root, you can end up with a new root, uh, and that can cause problems. So, just like in P1, we also have a leaderboard uh, where if you're, you're ranked to the first, um, you, you'll get 50% bonus points. And then you have to pass all the test cases to qualify, and you also have to submit it on time. As someone posted on Piazza today, like, it's not fair to the other people if you submit it the day after. And then a whole day, you, you, you know, do a bunch of optimizations so you can get that 50%. So you have to, it has to be submitted on time. OK? And then again, don't plagiarize, or otherwise we report you to Warner Hall. OK? Any questions about P2? So we'll announce when the recitation is next week. Uh, and then the, the code should be going out either today or tomorrow. Yes? Could it confirm for the VBlush tree? We can, we're supposed to support like an arbitrary number of keys like per node. Because uh, like all the examples on our slides are like pages. This question is, uh, for, uh, for the BBLS tree, should you put an arbitrary number of uh, key, keys per node size? I think it goes by, so we only support fixed length keys, so no, so no var chars. Uh, and I think there's a constant expression of uh, calculation where it gets the size of the, it, I think it automatically gets the size of the key you're trying to insert because it's templated, and then use that to compute how many keys you'd actually have in it. Yes? His question is how how his question is uh, how likely are there unknown bugs that we're not testing for in P1 that could, could you could hit <laughs> later on the semester? I mean, we, I like to think we've done a reasonable job of implementing enough tests to cover things. Um, I think there was. Well, the thing is, I passed all the tests, but I still saw a potential deadlock when I launched the Gen Tester on my. <laughs> okay, that let's, let's let's take that offline. Like I said, th th thread sanitizer, uh, like I said, I think we might have turned it off or something. Like, I know that it can give false positives for certain parts, for certain things, right? Yes? Can we still make submissions to Grayscope for P1? Yes, yeah, so the question, can we still make submissions for P1? So we'll make a new Grayscope submission with all the tests from P1, or, and then that you can just, that isn't graded, you just hit that up as much as you want. Yes? Yes? This question is, can P1 performance affect P2 performance? What do you think? <laughs> How much? Um, again, it, it, no, no, actually going back. So, well, so, all right, so it's, it's going to be in memory. Uh, so we, we say this somewhere. Um, so it's going to be in memory. So it's not like you're, you're spilling from disk. Uh, so, and it's not like it's the LRU K piece is going to run so that like if you have a really slow LRQ, L LRU implementation, that's going to slow you down. But like, yeah, if you hit the page table itself and that's 
inefficient, that will slow you down, yes. I forget whether we allow for swizzling. I'll have to double check that. If you do swizzling, then you almost never have to go to the buffalo manager. But I don't, I don't know whether we say that or not. OK? Any other questions? So again, going back here, every year, people wait to, to, to do this, right? <laughs> I'm, I'm, trust me, I'm warning you. Every year, people wait till, till the last week to try to implement this. And it, it they always fail. I can't think of anybody who's, who's, who's waited the last minute, because we can see the submission history. Uh, if, if, I don't think anybody's ever like, waited the last minute and is able to pull this off, right? So like the, the week before it's due, you're like, oh, let me start my B plus tree, right? What's a latch, right? Like, like, the, <laughs> like if you do that, you're gonna have problems. Trust me, okay? Mmm, I need something refreshing when I can finish manifesting. Too cold, a whole bowl like Smith and Wesson. One court, and my thoughts hip hop related. Write a rhyme, and my pen's intoxicated. Lyrics are quicker with a sip of more liquor. Since I'm a city slicker, brain waves are quicker. Rhymes I create rotate at a way too quick to duplicate. Fill a breeze as a skate. Mics at Fahrenheit when I hold a wheel tight. Then I'm in flight. We ignite, blood starts to boil. I heat up the party for you. Let my girl run me and my mic down with oil. Wreck still turn with third degree burn for one man. I heat up your brain, give it a suntan. So just cool, let the temperature rise to cool it off with St. Ives. <laughs>